welcome back to the Intelligent Conversations podcast. Today, I have the honor to learn from Derek Johnson. Derek is a life coach, personal trainer, and former army man. After overcoming various challenges, he uses those challenges to fuel his personal growth. He aims to give people results and hold them accountable. So Derek, thank you for coming on today. I appreciate you having me, Josh. Oh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited thank to learn you, from you. you, and I think the audience is as well. But I'm going to open up with this. It, from what I gathered, it seems like you started with the Army, and everything kind of comes back to there. So I guess what got you started there? Yeah, for sure. Great question. So my dad was U.S. Army for 20 plus years. So seeing your dad always up early working out and just all the perks of traveling, having all these different cultural friends and all that, that was just second nature. So I always loved seeing that. So as a kid, I would be sitting with the men and just watching them talk about life stories, whether it was deployments, where they've been in the world, just they just had stories for days. And I was like, it's it was always interesting. And also, as a kid, I was shy, nervous, super skinny, was bullied and all that. So I knew that I had to face my fears, fear of heights, fear of just the unknown, all these different fears. And I was like, all right, the only way for me to like grow the way that I want to would be to join and also like get into sports and everything. But yeah, so he inspired me with the discipline, with the military. And then my mother, she's German. So if you know anything about Germans, they're very strict and gung ho. <laughs> so the discipline I got from both of them. So my mother, she was a kindergarten teacher for 40 plus years and then finished at Montessori school, which is a private school. So they had very great teaching modalities, structure, discipline and all that. So they didn't like inspire me to excuse me. They didn't push me to get in the military, but I just wanted that structure <clears throat> outside of sports. So I got into ROTC in, in high school and then I did ROTC in college as well. And then after college, I went active for a few years and then finished off in the guard, which essentially you have your job with the government, with the army, and then also you help your state. So at that time I was in the state of Florida. So anytime that there was a storm, we would help out with storm relief and all that. So it was more so getting into the military to face my fears. Number two, for the perks, I didn't want to get in for 20 plus and retire, but I knew that it would look good on paper and get a lot of skill sets and have zero dollars of college debt. So I, I wanted to make sure to never owe anybody. So that's another <laughs> reason I joined. I wanted to get all my certifications and degrees and all that paid for. So I was always thinking ahead, but I knew that it was a stepping stone. So they inspired me to have that discipline. So I wanted to join that. But I knew deep down that the passion was to help people in general because growing up, saw a lot of traumatic things with family, with personal and all that. And it always felt good to help build other people up when you could see it in their eyes or feel their energy that they were in a low or dark place. So I always enjoyed that because I truly feel that anybody who's been through hell, quote unquote, or have experienced their own traumas, they can sense it in somebody else. And then like they're speaking from experience rather than just from a book or a theory and like they mean well, but you don't feel it as much as when somebody actually has seen it and you're like, wow, I didn't know he went through this or she went through that. So I wanted to give that to others. That's so cool. And if I could add it, anything to that, I think especially I like that you were focused on the end there with results. I think too many times we get obsessed with these theories and don't get me wrong. Uh, there's nothing wrong with theories. It's just, you got to put them to use. Like yeah. try and see, <laughs> see 100%. if it actually actually works. Like okay, everyone's telling me this is what you should do, right? And the theory is, is if I do it, then this will happen. Try it, and then yeah. once you do, uh, you'll find that. Oh, maybe that didn't work out how I thought. This is why people were warning me about this, or whatever it may be. And then, or on the other flip side, it's like, wow, like this theory that I had was worked out for me quite well. And I'm going to continue down this path. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I th yeah, I think that's so cool. So I'm kind of curious then. It's, it seems like discipline is a big part of this. And I mean, your family, you said your upbringing with that is important as well. How would you then suggest to someone to develop that? Because, I mean, you grew up with it and it, it seems like it would just be second nature to you. But how would you kind of, I guess, teach someone that didn't grow up with discipline? Yeah, for sure. So I always start with step one before we like try to create a routine for them or more structure and all that. I like to first say step one 
ask themselves, what can I eliminate that is not serving me? So it could be something as simple as they drink sodas, they smoke e-cigs, they smoke cigarettes, they drink too much, they're addicted to porn, like whatever their advice is, everybody has their thing. But if they can say, what can I eliminate that doesn't help me move forward? Let me slowly start to get rid of those things. And if there's other things that they could just replace with, so like if, if it is sodas, they could slowly just cut it down, have them on weekends, but more so take control of things that are not helping them. And really look at that first, because if we can get some things off of their chest and off of their plate, they can feel better for a moment. And then we can start to structure their schedule because the issue is many people, they have goals and they instantly try to look at the best path and attack it. And yes, that can work for some people, but the majority, they get overwhelmed within two months into that journey. And if they would have started and said, okay, what is not serving me? Hey, I wake up and I instantly look at social media. I instantly look at the news. I instantly do this. I'm procrastinating. I wake up at a different time every single day. I'm always in traffic, stressed out because I don't have a morning routine. Like all these different things that they can improve before they actually start the journey towards their goal. So I would first eliminate the things that are not serving them. And then next is master your morning routine. It sounds so simple, so straightforward, but so many people wake up at literally a different time every morning. So they never really feel in a flow unless it's that perfect amount of sleep, perfect amount of caffeine, their favorite pre-workout, whatever their thing is. But I recommend people wake up at the exact same time, seven days a week. So their circadian rhythm, their internal clock can be set and they start to feel like they have more control. They wake up before their alarm, they're more excited, where they're not dragging dragon ass like most people when the alarm goes off they hit snooze five times anxiety goes up an hour later they're stressed everybody's calling emailing texting and they're just like oh my god i haven't even had time for myself <laughs> so <laughs> that's a very common example but first eliminating those things and the step two is cultivating a power empowering morning routine so two two things that i suggest with that morning routine are do one thing for the body and one thing for the mind for the body, it could be, hey, he loves running. She loves to lift weights. This guy has two dogs. He loves going on a two-mile walk. Whatever physical activity it is to move the body, step one. And step two, something for the mind. If somebody has strong faith, praying, maybe meditation, visualization, journaling, writing, whatever they need to. But move the body first, then open the mind. And do only do those two things. Because... Many people also try to stack too many things in their morning routine because it's an endorphin hit. Hey, I wrote in my journal. I said my affirmations. I worked out. I had that perfect MCT oil in my coffee. And like, they feel good. It sounds good. But the rest of the day, they don't do anything productive. And they have this amazing morning routine, but then their life is like always stagnant. But they do these 10 things every morning and they love talking about it. But it doesn't really serve them because they're using too much energy on that thing. So I would just choose one for the body, one for the mind and wake up at the exact same time. And the last thing would be to look at what they're consuming on their devices, with food, with drinks, or the information and the people that they're around. What could I fade away from, eliminate, or just simply replace with something better? Starting with those things can make a drastic change before actually trying to attack the journey of success, entrepreneurship, school, yeah. whatever their path is. I agree with that. And if I could add anything to that, I would also say make sure you have at least one thing uh, every day that you look forward to because then it gives oh, yeah. you a reason to like get up like, oh, shoot, I have this today. I need to get this done. It kind of exactly. gives you that uh, sense of urgency, right? It's like, oh, crap, like I have to get up at this time if I want to get my workout in, uh, meditation, wh whatever you choose to do because if not, then you have this scheduled at this time. You have you have to go to that like you told oh, someone yeah. you'd be there and that's I, that's a big part of it too i would say having something that holds you accountable is the biggest part like i think as well 100%. Uh, i don't know how, how do you uh, go about making sure that you stay accountable because right there's those days where you wake up and you're like man i don't know <laughs> i don't know about that <laughs> yeah for sure that, that's a great question so with that being said something that i do myself and i teach my clients and i just tell my friends to do it is literally say out loud and in your head, people depend on me. So if you wake up and you want to hit snooze, you don't feel like going to that meeting, that interview, whatever that thing is that we have to do, all of us don't feel like doing many things. 
myself included. But if you say out loud, people depend on me and think of them. I don't have kids. We have a pit bull, but I think of clients. I think of social media. I think of the messages that I get every few days. It's like, man, I saw your video. I needed that. Hey, my uncle just died and I saw that post. Hey, this isn't like strangers, whoever it is. If we look at it in that lens, we get a rush. Like I have chills saying it because I do it so much. And then you'll show up as a different person. And it's more so selfless than selfish because like social media and society, they're like, oh, if you do your self work and self development, that's selfish because you're not spending time with your loved ones. And it sounds cool. But it's like, if that person feels stagnant in life, that family dinner is not going to help them at all, because they're going to be thinking, I need to be doing something with my life. So like they're bringing negative energy to the dinner table. But if he or she worked on themselves, and they're like, wow, I'm, I'm excited. I look forward to my family dinner, my family breakfast, because I feel like I'm getting somewhere and I feel fulfilled and excited. They bring a whole nother character and energy to the table. And everybody's like, wow, you're something's different about you, Josh. Like, what, what have you been doing? And then like, it just feels good to be in that energy and frequency. So step one, I would just say out loud, literally people depend on me and think of those individuals because as humans, Genetically, we're all selfish to an extent because our body's just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. So it's like me, me, me. Why me, God? Why this? I don't want to do this. I don't feel good. Why if I slow? I'm tired. I'm hungry. Whatever. We all do it. That's the moment to think of others. Another thing that I do, which I don't hear discussed enough, is if somebody can learn about both of their family trees and learn the history of what grandma, great grandpa, all these different people actually went through, and then we realize that our problems are irrelevant almost. So like my yeah. example, when when I say people depend on me, sometimes I might I may not feel it. So then I have to go to the dark side and I say, my Oma, which is my grandma in Germany, survived the Holocaust. She was hiding in the attic. And then I go back to myself and say, well, my weak self, like not get out of bed just because I don't feel like it. Like she was up there hiding, being quiet with the kids and saved them. And so I go to the extremes to humble myself and to make it look like I just don't feel like doing this thing. That's a disrespect to them or anybody else that went through something. So those two perspectives can give you a rush, can give you like a rush of tears, but it makes it bigger than just yourself, where if somebody does that frequently, they realize that they're being pulled to a greater thing rather than just having to push themselves out of bed, push themselves to work. I feel like if somebody has a bigger cause and thinks of these people or situations that they're going to be pulled towards a bigger purpose rather than just the everyday workflow. I agree. I, I like that. And I like that you brought in family as well. I think if you look back and if you really think about it, uh, all those people, both sides of the family all got together and now it's at you and it's your obligation. It's like, all right. Oh yeah. Like is it, what, what am I putting out there? Like, what, how is uh, my family line going to remember me, right? Because exactly. hopefully, I mean, even if you decide not to have kids, uh, brothers, sisters, cousins, they'll have kids and maybe they'll tell stories about you like, oh, uh, Derek, way back when did this and he was just incredible and that means you can do it as well. And I think we kind of owe it to our descendants and also our ancestors. So yeah, 100%. I agree. I think that's, yeah, I think that's, I like that you brought that up. So how did you get into personal training then? Because you started with the army. How did you get into like, all right. I mean, you had that uh, passion to help others, but how do you kind of decide, all right, it's going to be personal training that I'm doing? Yeah, for sure. So what got me into it, I was tired of being the skinny kid. And so when you move from Germany to America, it's a culture shock at first, especially in the South, not everything negative, but more so like everything is go, go sports is way more hardcore. And it's just like the whole bravado. And at that time I was never in an American school. I was in German schools. And then I was telling my friends, I'm like, Hey, it's just like the movies. There's the bullies, there's the jocks, there's the freaking cheerleaders, there's this, there's that. It's like, everything is just like in your face. And I just wasn't used to it. So I was that skinny, nice German kid that and mix and people are like, I don't know what, what he is. And I'm like soft spoken and shy and nervous. And then mm -hmm. I was getting bullied. And also when you're half black and half white in the South, you got to prove yourself when you're playing sports. So the, a blunt example is I had to get in a lot of fights to prove myself on the basketball court because they thought I was soft because of like my complexion, the way I look. So I was called a pretty boy and all that because back then we just moved from Germany. So I was literally as white as Michael Jackson. I mean, I'm pretty 
tan right now, but my German side took over. But long story short, I had to fight the bully because I was getting bullied at home because another part of the story is both parents were alcoholics functioning. So it was only at night though. Only at night, never affected their career or personal life. So with the rage of your parents in your face yelling between like 8 p.m. to 1 a.m., 300 plus days a year, being the skinny kid, nervous and scared at home, nervous and scared at school, I just told myself enough is enough. So I got obsessed with learning bodybuilding books, reading Men's Health, watching Bruce Lee interviews, reading all these this different information to learn about the body, but more so the mind. So I first built my own physique and pushed myself because the nights of drama with the parents and all that, workouts were more so a mental thing. So after weight training, after running, I was just mentally calm. And then I would work on my faith. And then I just got excited about life to help others. So I was always chasing that high of the calmness after an extreme workout. And so then I knew that long term, it was going to be deeper than just personal training. But that is initially what it was is my own self work. And then I love seeing others happy, losing the weight, gaining the confidence, improving their relationship with food. He or she was bullied as a kid as well. And that's why they're they were anorexic, they, they binge ate, they did all these things or their uncle made fun of them. It's like, it's always deeper than just a visual thing or a performance for athletics. And so that's honestly what got me into it was my own journey of getting bullied. And I was sick and tired of it at home and in public. And then I built myself not to just beat up the bullies, but more so to be confident within myself to then help others because people would see me a year or two later and they're like, whoa, that's you like you're a totally yeah. deal. You used to be that skinny kid. And then I would teach them. I was like, Hey, you want to learn how I did this? They're like, yeah. And everything was always holistic. That's what I've always been about. Holistic approach, just natural and just going from there. But it was inspiring because they saw that I did it for myself. I wanted to teach others how to do it and the positive ripple effect of it. That's so cool. I, I mean it. I, th I think that's cool. I appreciate it. That uh, you do it to, help others and especially that they came to you and they're like, well, we're not seeing a change, right? You actually went out and did it. Uh, that that's the part we, we forget sometimes. It's like, oh, we yeah. have this great <laughs> idea. We just, we have to do it. Um, so it seems like then you target the mind before you target the body. Is it, am I kind of getting that right? So like yes. when you're working with people, you'll say, all right, let's first fix your mind. And then we'll start working on your body. Is that kind of right? Yeah. So at first I was only a personal trainer and people always knew me as a fitness guy. They're like, he's always pushing himself. He barely sleeps. He's always trying to help people. And that was, that was great. It was a natural thing, but I didn't want to be known as just the fitness guy or the protein bro or whatever somebody wants to call it. Yeah. So what inspired me to get into life coaching years later was I had hundreds of clients in person and online at college campuses, family in different countries or friends. And then I would see people months or years later and they would lose the progress. One side of me, my younger immature self was like, he or she's weak. They went backwards. <laughs> but then yeah. the mature side said, I let them down because I didn't give them the mental tools to fix those bad habits, overcome traumas, everything at a deeper root because a lot of people, they just train for the family reunion. They train for the summer beach getaway. They train for their best friend's wedding. And then after that, they lose the fire. So they're kind of like this all year and they're never really making long-term longevity progress. So because of that, that's what got me into life coaching. And I dove deep into that with certifications. And then nowadays, and in the past few years since I've been a life coach is that clients and people that are around me, they less likely go backwards. If they do, it's because like something really dark happened. They just say, you know what? I'm, I'm okay going backwards. But besides that, it's like 2%. But the 98% all get excited about life, go forward. And the reason why is because they ripped off the skin of trauma, insecurities, binge eating, vices, preconceived notions from other people, limiting beliefs from their family, like all these things that exist. They started to peel those things off to be able to think bigger, think clear, and most importantly, could actually like breathe. We're like, wow, I had a great workout. My clothes are fitting better, but I feel like I'm breathing better because I, I something out of here got released. 
And it was usually the trauma. And then I realized that their career would go up, their relationships, every other part outside of fitness would elevate. And that was always and is still the most fulfilling thing for me because I remember then on day one, an example, one client, she had social anxiety. She could not go in public without being on the phone with a friend or a family member. She just had extreme anxiety. And I've never seen it that extreme, but I saw it as a challenge. Said, we're, we're going to work on this within X amount of time. We're going to tackle that. She went to therapists, went to all these different people, and somebody's recommending medication to each their own, but I don't push medication at all. I say, hey, there's a lot we can do mentally and just physically to get over this. So we got her in shape, did all that, then did the deep inner work, and then she started thriving. Presentation skills went up, sales skills went up, would go out to eat by herself. And for her, it was huge. Other people would be like, I always go out to eat by myself. But for her, it was, <clears throat> excuse me, for her, it was literally like crippling anxiety of social aspects of being by herself. So that's one example. So that part happened because of the life coaching, not just the fitness, but seeing that and everybody in her life was positively affected and then tons of other stories with other people. But it's just fulfilling because I remember them at day one and then now they just keep going up and they're just excited about life. It's interesting how... Uh, the rest of your life falls into order once you start taking care of some of these other things, right? Oh, yeah. You, you talked about how, like, some of their careers take off or how, uh, uh, in, in your case now, she can go out to eat by herself, and that's a huge deal. And it, it, it all starts, yeah, with those simple, simple things. And I remember reading a book, actually, where at, at the end of the book, they – they challenged me. I've actually met the author. He's a great friend of mine. And he, uh, he challenges us. It's like, all right, write down and rate each aspect of your life. So, uh, your physical health, uh, spiritual health, mental health, uh, career, all, all those, uh, aspects of your life and rate each yeah. one and then find which one is not doing that well. And I guarantee you, uh, where it's low is probably the source of why all the others are not where you want it to be. Like maybe you're focusing, like maybe you're just more inclined towards your career and you want to have a great career. And that is, you know, nothing wrong with that. But then you're wondering like, oh, I'm not where I want to be. Sometimes it's actually taking that look back and saying, all right, maybe I need to get my body right, my mind right, or I need to get my uh, family affairs in order. Or I need to get a, oh, yeah. a spiritual health, whatever it may be, in, in order. And then... It allows uh, that other areas of your life to progress as well. Yeah, and definitely. Just yeah, one last thing. I think it in order for I'll, I'll just share this. Uh, I used to have just terrible when I was younger, just terrible, terrible fear of public speaking. I was terrified of it. And then one day I was like, you know what? This is kind of ridiculous. Like it, it got to the point where I would just not like function in class. Like, you know what? This is kind of ridiculous. And, you know, your friends kind of poke fun at you. Yeah. Like, ah, all right. And finally, I was like, all right, like, let's figure this out. And I decided, you know what? I'm just going to raise my hand to say, I mean, you probably remember doing this in class, the Pledge of Allegiance. That's it. I'll just raise my hand to lead it. All I have to say is two words. Ready, begin. It was terrifying, right, at that time. But then uh, as it progressed, it's like, all right, maybe I can raise my hand and ask a question or maybe I can and just progress in a long time. And here we are now uh, hosting a podcast. And uh, but it, it takes time too. is kind of the point I'm trying to get at. So how do you have, I guess, patience with yourself? Because that's I, I find myself struggling with that a lot and other others, I'm sure, struggle with it as well. Just patience with yourself to keep going when you know, things get tough. Yeah, for sure. Great question. So with that patience, I like to think of an analogy. Every single night before we lay in bed or before we get in bed or even like sit on the couch, imagine you have to watch a time lapse video fast forward of how your day went. So you see a video of yourself. So there's a camera in the top of the room or somebody's following you around. Like you have to watch what you did in that day. Today's Friday. So if tonight when we're about to sit down or lay down, we have to watch a video on time lapse. Will you be proud of the man that you saw in that video? And we can only say yes or no. We can't say maybe we can't say, well, I should have. We can only say yes or no. So what can we do to say yes 
more often. And it doesn't mean we're going to have a perfect day. But what it means is it helps us get focused on the present day and win today. Because a lot of the stress and anxiety is coming from somebody's past or coming from a what if scenario in the future. What if that doesn't work? What if this, this guy got rich, now he's in a mansion by himself and not married and miserable. What if that happens to me? Like there's endless scenarios yeah. that people do or the other one, they're worried about their past bullying, family, et cetera, et cetera. And they're never really present. But if we can just focus on today, today is Friday. So like, I'm not worried about tomorrow. I don't care what happened yesterday. Even if something didn't go right, only try to focus on the day that we're in. And if somebody writes it on paper, they can have their checklist. If they do it digitally, that's fine. But check off every box, like whatever it is, and just have that progress to hit, hit your head on the pillow and be proud where you're like, ah, I'm not exhausted because I'm annoyed. I'm tired because I crushed the day. So it's a whole nother level of tired zone or exhaustion because you're like, wow, I did a lot. Like I literally can't even keep my eyes open. I have one more task, but I'm not going to be angry because I didn't finish it because I did so much today that I'll finish that in the morning. And it's completely different than laying in bed thinking, dang, I didn't check any of those boxes. And then that annoyance pops up. We wake up feeling that and all those things start to grow because the next day we're trying to make up from yesterday and then going from there. So being present in the day we're in and simplifying it by what can I do to win today? I'm going to work out. I'm going to call the clients. I'm going to do this, whatever's on somebody's agenda and try to get all those things done. And the intent is just to win that day and get 1% better every day. Because if we win, today's the 8th, September 8th, as we're recording this. So if we win uh -huh. this week, first seven days, we win that. If we win the whole month of September, we're confident and just slowly build from there. Because Again, usually the stress and anxiety comes from the past or from the future of the what if. So we're stressing about something that's fake, something that's in the past, and then it, it derails us from the right now. So we actually don't get the task done. That'll actually give us the confidence. But harnessing that morning is honestly one of the most effective things ever. Because if somebody goes 90 days in a row not missing their morning routine, even on a Saturday and Sunday, their confidence is going to be out of this world. And it doesn't matter exactly what they did, but they just said, I'm going to do this thing for 90 days, my morning routine. And if I own my first hour, I'll be way more proactive in the day than reacting to everything. So that would be my suggestion. I like that. And to add something to that, I would say you can only, you can only learn from the past. Uh, you can only influence the future, but the only time you actually get to live is the present moment. And oh, yes. Yeah, I, it would be interesting, though, to see. Uh, I bet someone, some YouTubers probably done this, but to just record, oh, yeah. like hire someone to record your entire day, like for a week, even a month, right? That that might be a stretch, but just follow you around 24 hours. And I mean, obviously, when you go to bed, they can just set up a camera and yeah, uh, <laughs> go to bed themselves or not bother recording. But I don't know. I, I think that would be... Uh, something, something yeah and, and the thing is that a lot of people are never honest with themselves they have too much pride and ego that they won't be honest and say i have not worked out in 30 days i'm lazy and they're not like judging themselves they're just speaking on historical data and facts that most people be like well you know i've had anxiety you know i got a lot going on you know and they start the you know rants instead of just saying like hey i missed 15 days in a row like that's why i feel like crap it's not anything in the past or future. It's just like I let myself down so much that I lost a lot of myself. Excuse me. I lost a lot of my confidence. And now I have a lot of self-doubt because usually just days of losing where in the losing, it doesn't mean we're a loser. It just means we didn't progress forward. And if somebody does that repeatedly mm -hmm. for days, weeks or months on end, it's very hard for them to get excited about the future, think about life and all that. But if they just look at the facts it always breaks down to they didn't do something that aligns with their better version of themselves. He said that he was going to stop chain smoking pack of cigarettes. He had zero attempts to quit. He's going to be annoyed with himself and to, to not think of the annoyance, he's going to grab a bottle or another cigarette to, to tap out where it's like the repeated process, but like they won't be blunt with themselves. But the people that are that say enough is enough, they'll push the pride and ego inside and say, you know what? I haven't done my part. And on a spiritual standpoint, some people are like, well, 
So just side note, one of my biggest pet peeves that people say is God did not have it in his plans for me. God didn't have it in his plans for me. Sounds great, but many people, most of society uses that as a cop-out line to justify their laziness and bad habits. So if you look at it on a spiritual sense, God, the universe, whatever somebody believes in is not going to bless us with the success, whatever that thing is, if we didn't do our part. And that's the thing people miss. Like they're always hoping, wishing, praying. That's great and all. But if they don't do the work, they get lost in like the Holy Land and all this where they're talking. And it's like you haven't done anything in 60 days. But now you're going to use a cop out line to say that that's disrespect to the creator saying, oh, he didn't have it in a store in store for me. It's like, no, you didn't do anything for X amount of time. So you're not going to get the opportunity. So I think a lot of people like they're just not honest with themselves because of pride and ego. And I hear that a lot. It's many people that I went to school with and all that, or even their parents say, yeah, you know, I wanted to do this 10 years ago. And you can always look at them. It's like binge drinking out of shape, didn't take care of themselves beats as well. Like just, you can look for two seconds. You can just read the person. It's just like, Hey, we're not judging you, but this is why, like, what do you expect? You did this to yourself. So I've always been a realist about that of looking at the data from a neutral standpoint of that person's life or whatever the trajectory timeline was like, did they do their part? Exactly. And I, I agree. I think if, uh, one of the things I would, I guess kind of to challenge that again is sometimes, right. Maybe they do all they can. Right. Yeah. And then, at the end of the day, it's like, uh, they, they didn't get the result they wanted and they keep trying over and over. They put in the hours, they put in the work, they get their body and mind right. And then, uh, at, at the end of the day, they realize like, like, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, but there's an external factor that says, no, you can't do this, right? Like you didn't qualify or you didn't meet, uh, th these expectations that we had or yeah. the standard, like for a job, let's say, like, let's say you worked really hard for this promotion. You're staying in after work. You're doing all these things, right? You're uh, doing whatever you can, but then time for promotion comes up and they choose this other guy. Uh, what, how do you kind of, I guess, kind of overcome those setbacks and still progress forward? Yeah, for sure. So those moments I challenge people to look at in the perspective of, this is a character building moment. Yes, I'm annoyed. Yes, I'm probably pissed off that I didn't get the promotion. But before we use too much energy on that feeling, we're not pretending that feeling doesn't exist. But it's to slow down and say, what do I need to work on on myself? Or have I been just doing the work and not shown any gratitude these past six months? Like, have I said thank you to if somebody believes in God, if they want to thank their parents, like whoever, they think help them and serve them in life. Have they been grateful as well? Because sometimes we can get lost in just the grind mode where we're not grateful for the things we have right now. And we're so focused on the bigger thing, the promotion, the money, the success that we overlook everything that's around us where we're like, we have food, water, shelter, air condition, a thousand dollar phone in your hand, like all these different things where it's just like, are we actually grateful for all these things that we have? Because sometimes we'll get lost in the, they turn me down on the interview. Where it's like, okay, that does suck, but there's other opportunities. Is that the only one? Or is that even that person's passion? Because sometimes people are working hard towards things that deep down aren't really the things that they want. It's what mom, dad, uncle, professor, somebody else is like, hey, this is the safe route, or this is the route, or because of your personality type, you would do really well in this career. And some people, we all need the life experience, like try different things until you find what your thing is. But it depends on if that's even their thing. But the step one is always, what is this teaching me? Do I have a bad level of patience with myself? Am I qualified for the position? Okay, the paper says yes. Okay. Have I really been grateful about things? Okay. How long have I been in this company? One year or five years like that person? And really just looking at different perspectives and just being neutral. Again, it's easier said than done. But looking at all those perspectives can help a lot. So we don't just feel rejected, quote unquote, or that we're a failure. So going back to the drawing board to say, what else could I work on? And next time I'm going to come back better. So the last analogy would be everyone's struggles and setbacks is just their start or part of their comeback story. 
So the only reason any of us watch movies or read books or anything is everybody loves a comeback story. So if we can say I'm the main character, they denied me and said, no, okay, let's see what happens. I'm going to work on my skill. And next thing you know, I'm going to skip these two positions or start my own business, whatever it is. But if you look at it like that, we get a fire in us. So yeah, definitely let yourself be human, be annoyed, yell, cry, like let, let, let all that stuff out first. But then go back to the drawing board and say, okay, you know what? I grabbed my steering wheel for a minute. I yelled in the car. and was like, ah, I thought I had it. I'm going to go back home. What can I work on? Hey, I suck at this skill. Let me build that one up. Yeah. And, and those, those emotions can fuel us too. And I, I oh, like yeah. that you mentioned that it's okay to like punch, punch the wheel, like that steering wheel here and there. Cause sometimes, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, this was my thoughts at times too. It's like, oh, you just need to not like almost not feel anything. It's like, okay, this is your fault. Like take a hundred percent accountability, which is true. You need to take accountability. Uh, maybe there's like, you mentioned there's parts that you just, you didn't get the full perspective and uh, why maybe that person was more qualified than you. Yeah. Sometimes you just, you, you got it. You got to let it go. And what, what I originally thought was, okay, like this bad thing happened to me. I just, okay, I'm angry. Shout in the back of your mind. Like, let's go and yeah. just kind of, like you said, that grind. And that itself can also be, now, now thinking about it, can be pretty dangerous because then you start neglecting uh, other parts of your life. And uh, I like to say, neglection is the silent killer. It When, when you neglect something, it, 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 it creeps back up on you. It's like the skeleton in the closet. You kind of oh, just yeah. keep shoving it away. And then eventually at some point it just gets too full. And it, so, or someone opens it and yeah. it just, it all comes out. So, 100%. so then, yeah. How do you kind of, uh, maintain, I guess the right mindset. So then maybe you don't have those things kind of pushed away and uh, stored away. So, I do a thing that I like to call the transparency exercise, where we first start with step one, writing out that person's goals. So they grab a sheet of paper. I'm old school. There's more power in putting a pen to paper rather than just apps because you'll get interrupted by the other notifications. So just keep it old school. But if somebody can be crystal clear on what they actually want. So I like to think of version 10.0. What does he look like? Where does he live? Is he married? Does he have kids? What industry would he be in? What does he drive? Where does he go? What does he like to eat? Like, just walk through the day of that version 10.0 and really try to harness it. Where does he live? It's a two story house. It's this and that. It's in this city or this country. And then really have fun with it. Work that, work those creative juices where we're out of just grind mode and work mode and just have fun with it. Let that inner child just creativity flow and write it all down. Even if it doesn't make sense, just write bullet points. And that person's getting excited. They feel the rush. More things come to it. They start to use all their senses. And they're like, wow, I, I've never really done this. Usually I just say, well, I want to be rich or I want to be successful. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, what do you really want? <laughs> and then they start to write it out. And they're like, this is actually powerful. So starting with that. And then the next one would be to, all right, what can I eliminate now? Going back to what I mentioned earlier is writing out a list. Hey, Anita, I need to eliminate this. My screen time, doing this in the morning really honest with yourself and you're just being transparent. And then the next thing is going to be to write out a list of things that you can accept about yourself. And we're not making this our identity. It's more so an example. I accept that I cannot change the mentality of a lot of my family on both sides. Like some people you have to love from a distance, but with some people, you're always going to bump heads and you're not going to get anywhere talking. Yeah. You're like, Hey, I'll see you on the birthday. I'll see you on the Christmas. On, on holidays, but I write down, I accept that I cannot change some of their mentalities. I accept this. I accept sometimes I'm very hard on myself. I accept sometimes I do the age thing. By this age, you need to do that. By that age, you need to do that. If you don't do that by that age, then you're not going to be successful. And like all this pressure, and I just write it down. So whatever somebody writes in their accept, it could also be that person is dyslexic, has OCD. But they're being neutral the entire time they're writing. They're not going to post it. They're not going to show it to anybody. So we have the clarity of the goals. What can they eliminate? What can they accept about themselves or their situation and their upbringing? And then the last section of the quadrant would be 
what can I preserve because I accept this thing? So because I accept that I cannot change some of the mentality of my family, I can preserve my mental peace, my calmness, my energy, because I used to get annoyed. So like my father's from Mississippi. So a lot of that side of the family are very obese. And I was the fitness cousin and I would be annoyed with my family that my seven year old cousin was like 200 pounds. And I'm like, this is your dad and mom's fault. And it would literally like enrage me just seeing that. And then I realized how much time and energy I was wasting. I was like, they don't want to change. Like, yes, I feel bad for, for my cousin or whoever it is, but it's not my job. So, so yeah. So with that being said is because I don't try to help those people, I support them, but I can preserve my peace, my calmness. So if people really just start with the transparency first and look at themselves from the inside out without judgment. And, and again, it's very hard at first, but if people do that, they're less likely going to push things under the rug, push it in the closet because they never actually face themselves or look the man in the mirror, quote unquote. So facing it more because those are like some of the most authentic people is that they're really open about anything because they're open with themselves. And that's the only difference. So they're like, hey, he could say whatever about me. Everybody knows that about me. So it's like, what else is there? <laughs> There's nothing yeah. in the closet because we already put it out to the world or to myself. So it's an interesting concept, though. It always starts with you. The most important the most important person is you. So really facing all those things, whatever they are, anger, insecurities, trauma and all that, writing it out and just looking at it from a bird's eye view and then saying, OK, what could I work on by myself? What do I need help with? And then at that point, somebody could go to a teacher, coach, mentor, whoever, um, church, whatever their thing is, and then start to do the work. But most importantly, they'll actually feel calmer and more focused because they first step one is face all those things. The good, the bad, the ugly, the dark, the confusing before they're like, eh, you know, I don't want to talk about that today. <laughs> I made that mistake five years ago. Yeah, I don't, let's not bring that up. <laughs> yeah. No, I... I like that. I like that a lot. And you have to I like that you say to just face it and that you have to pretty much overcome that fear. Right. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to is that you're fearing whether it is the judgment others may pose to you or the fear that, uh, like you won't live up to maybe the, uh, potential everyone thinks you are, or it, it all stems from fear. Exactly. And if if I I'm gonna use this as the intelligent question of the day, and that's uh, we, we experience a lot of fear, uh, insecurity, all that in our lives, and like I said, I think a lot of it does stem from fear. How do you, I guess, kind of get that confidence? Because I like to say the first time you're gonna fail, that's just or yes, you know, encounter setbacks. That's just just the reality. But how do you, I guess, not let fear win and just keep going and no, no matter what, like you just don't quit? Yeah, great question. So I would first start with getting into the best physical shape. And it's not about the abs. It's not about the chest. It's not about a nice butt. It's not about any of those things. It's more so the mental discipline that that person feels confident in how they walk, their body language. It's not about the size of the muscle, but they just feel good. And they're like... I crush workouts, I eat healthy. So if somebody does originally just start with those two things, their level of confidence is going to be so much higher because a lot of first level lack of confidence comes from how we feel and look. I don't want to speak because I think they're going to look at my gut. I don't want to speak because they're going to think I look here. I don't want to speak. like whatever it is. That person has acne. They're like all those things play a lot into that person's confidence before they actually worry about the fear of rejection or failing. So I would first harness working on their body, working on their mind, just on a basic level, consistent exercise, consistent, healthy meals to first feel better. Because if they feel better about the person they see in the mirror and actually how they feel from the inside out, they already have confidence to say, okay, I, d I can do this. I'm not where I wanna be yet, but I feel great. Let's attack this goal. If they do get rejected or anything like that, they won't take it personal because if they already don't like themselves in the way they look and then somebody rejects them, they're going to be like, wow, I don't even like looking in the mirror. They rejected me. I'm this, I'm that. Yeah. And then we start telling ourselves a very negative story. So I would first harness the body and the mind on the basic level. 
And then also, if somebody does have a fear, to face those fears. So mine was heights. So as a kid, I didn't want to get on roller coasters. I didn't want to go on a rock climbing wall. So I actually faced those things. And then from there in the military, jumping out of helicopters, doing all those things. So I overcame it. So like, it'll try to creep in sometimes if we're on a flight, like out of nowhere, I'll be half asleep. And then that inner child's like, Hey, what if this and this happens? And these intrusive <laughs> final destination thoughts start playing. And I'm like, all right, chill out. <laughs> like, Let me grab a cup of water. Let me chill out and go back to sleep. But I'm saying all this because many people in society nowadays, they see fear as danger. But the only way, as we all, all of us already know, is that the only way to plow through it is to actually face it. And if they can face it sooner than later, they're going to feel so much freer. And then going back to an extreme thought is, what is the worst thing that will happen when I go to this interview? So they can literally say to themselves, will I die when I go in there? And they're going to be like, no. That's a stupid statement. It's like, all right, then what are we scared about? And they're like, huh, I'm not going to die when I go in there. It's like, okay, you're just scared to talk to them. Like, are they going to hit you? Are they going to shoot? It's like, no. So sometimes we literally just have to play a mental game and say, well, where's this fear coming from? And it's usually from a skill that we lack. So like what you say with public speaking, I was that kid too. I didn't want to stand up in front of the class, <laughs> yeah. raise my hand. And I always knew the right answer. I was just good in school, but I was like, eh, not going to raise it. And then finally standing up to myself, it just felt good. So yes, it all starts with us, fitness-wise and physical-wise, overall wellness for the mind and body. And then from there, facing the fear, whatever it is. If it is public speaking, my biggest suggestion to people that have anxiety, public speaking issues, anything of that nature is go to improv. Once a month, yes. you can go there for free. Go to improv. Everybody's there to be a random char character, so there's no crowd. <laughs> Like yeah. it's, it's one of the most effective things ever. And people don't talk about it. Most people are like, Oh, I, I would never do that. It's like, no, that's exactly <laughs> why you should go because you said that. <laughs> like, exactly. so it'll get rid of a lot of things for people, but yeah, definitely facing their fears because that adrenaline rush afterwards cannot be bought. No pill is going to do it. No drink, no cheers from family. Like nothing is going to give them that feeling, but facing it. Like one of my best friends, we're from Florida, so we went to all the theme parks and everything, and I was like, I'm going to get you on a roller coaster. I'm not going to push you on it, but I'm going to brainwash you and hype you up. You're going to get on it. Next thing you know, we're going to be ticking up. He's like, that's never going to happen. It ended up happening, and we're ticking <laughs> up in the Hulk in Islands of Adventure Universal Studios, and he's looking at me. He's like, you motherfucker. And I was like, hey, we're, I was like, what's going to happen? We, we'll die together, or we're going to laugh at the end. And he's like, all right, let's see. And then at the end, he was like, dude, that was amazing. Like, he was so hype. And then he just kept riding roller coasters. And I only did it for him to, like, have that rush. It wasn't that I was calling him weak or anything like that. But ever since that day, and this is like six years ago, he was just like, man, that fear crippled me for so long. And I had fun. Next thing you know, a year later, he went skydiving. So it's, wow. it's interesting what happens when we finally face it. We realize that we made this thing bigger and it controlled us the entire life. Yeah. Dang. That, that's so <laughs> cool. No, I, man, I hate, I hate to wrap this up too. And I, I actually, there's a story somewhat similar. Uh, no, not, not even close. That That's awesome though. They went skydiving, but uh, my friend actually, he, he got the hottest pepper in the world. Uh, and he <laughs> gave, and you know, and we, this is when we were younger and we're like, Oh yeah, let's do it. Like what the heck? And it's not necessarily that we had this fear of, uh, you know, spicy food or whatever, but you know, we all had it. It was, I wouldn't recommend anyone have it. It's not, it's not good. <laughs> it doesn't taste good. It's, oh, it's the worst thing you can ever have. But after that, it kind of built up this, oh, like if I can eat that, then I mean, obviously I can have a habanero or I can have a ghost pepper. I mean, I've had the hottest pepper in the world. What, like what's stopping you from trying oh, yeah. the, some of these other peppers? And yeah, I think it's kind of a similar thing. It's once you right go on that roller coaster, it's like, oh, that wasn't as bad. Let's try skydiving, right? It's kind of keep going higher and higher. And that's what we all want to do in our lives. Yeah, hundred percent. If we face our fears, that's the only way to grow because society is going to tell you that's dangerous. And then they're all going to be scared and in a box and miserable. And just like, it's, it's sad to see like the state now, like everybody's just scared to pursue anything. So they're all like this and, but they're all 
in a group of miserable people, but the people and the friend groups and families that are excited about life, they've all pushed out of their comfort zone. And they all have that rush because they understand each other. It's amazing to see. If you look at a table in any restaurant, you can just tell who's in a high vibration of life. Even if they are looking at their phone, they just have a different level of energy where they're like, they look like they travel together. They look like they've hiked and have crazy stories and all this stuff. And they just did it together. And it's, it's just awesome. And on the flip side, the other table is just like, no, the world's about to end. This and it. Like they're always worried about the worst thing. And it's like, oh God, <laughs> paranoia. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah, it's not a fun way to live. Well, Derek, thank you for coming on today. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Josh. Time. Thank you. So how's the best way people can find you, reach out to you? If they want to work with you, what's the best way they can do that? The best way would be my website, fitwithderick, D-E-R-I-C-K.com, fitwithderick.com. On there, they'll see many transformation pictures and videos. Some are fitness and some are life whether it's personal. So they'll watch the video, they'll see their different journeys and all that. So I just love showing real people, real results. And on social media, it's fit with Derek to the number two, same picture on every platform. But my whole intent with social media is to motivate people, make them think and also plant a seed in their head. When they're about to hit snooze, they're like, Oh, yeah, he called me out in that video. Let me get my ass up. So like just planting the seed and next thing you know, they, you know, they message and they're like, Hey, I did that thing and I actually feel good. I'm like, Hey, I'm not pushing any ruru or stuff that's not going to work. So yeah. yeah, it's my whole intent is to push people. So they're proud of who they are. That's awesome. That's really cool, Derek. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming on today. I, I, I appreciate it, Josh. As you can tell everyone that is Derek Johnson. He's a very intelligent person, had great things to share. I challenge you guys, if anything spoke to you, if you're ready to change your life, to reach out to Derek. I'm sure he'd be happy to help you. Stay tuned until next week. We have a great guest lined up for you guys. See you guys next week, and let's get after it. Hey, everyone. If you liked this episode and would like to hear more, be sure to hit that subscribe or follow button. We release a new episode every Wednesday for you guys to listen to. Thank you guys so much for the support that you give. We could not have done this without you guys. If you would like to be a potential guest on the show, check out intelligentconvos.com and fill out the form there. Thank you guys again, and let's get after it.